myself, and we're in Melbourne this week, and I'm sitting with a longtime friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Jenny Jamison. So Dr. <laughs> Jenny Jamison's not only uh, uh, training to be a specialist in emergency here at one of Melbourne's biggest and most prestigious hospitals, uh, but also has a passion and experience in global health. So it's great to see you, Jenny. Lovely to be here, Sandra. Lovely to see you again. Yeah, always. Um, so Jenny, a lot of people struggle with combining an interest in clinical medicine with a, a desire to work at a global level or at a population level. And you're one of the few people that's managed to do that and continues to manage to do that, but in quite a unique way. So can you tell us a little bit about your work and your interests in global health? Sure. So um, I am specialising in emergency medicine here in Melbourne, uh, mostly at the Alfred Hospital. I'm currently doing my paediatric training at the Royal Children's Hospital. And um, much as I love clinical medicine, I also have a, an equal interest in global health um, and particularly humanitarian medicine. And I spent 2012 working with Medicine Sans Frontier in Kunduz, which is a, uh, a small province in northern Afghanistan. And we were uh, working in a trauma hospital up there. In addition to the, the humanitarian side of things, I, I, I love the, the local global health projects. And there's a few, um, few organisations that I'm involved in here in, uh, at a very local level in, in Melbourne and Australia. Yeah. So could we, could we start with the local level and then we'll go to the global in a moment. <laughs> so in addition yeah. to uh, working, which I think is probably the scariest job on earth, being a, an emergency <laughs> doctor for tiny, tiny little human beings. But in addition to that, you're also involved in some global health projects here at a grassroots level in Melbourne. So what are you doing here in Melbourne? Sure. So one of the projects that I got involved in uh, just after I graduated from university was called the Global Health Gateway. Mm. And the Global Health Gateway is an online platform, a global health website designed for um, anyone to use and to access global health resources. The reason it was actually established was because whilst there's lots of global health support and um, organisations to be part of while you're going through university, no matter what course you're doing, whether it's medicine, nursing, uh, physio, op um, um, optometry, um, there's lots of uh, possibilities and opportunities as a student to get involved. And, and we noticed that as um, all these health workers were graduating, their interest and their um, ability to engage in global health was diminishing. And all these people who'd been really involved in university began to drop off the bandwagon. Mm, okay. And one way we wanted to um, re-engage them or keep them engaged was to make things really easy and mm -hmm. uh, have a one-stop shop for all healthcare workers to be able to look at one website and find out possibilities for volunteering, work possibilities, study possibilities, um, look and find out what interesting lectures and in global health might be going on around Australia, mm. download any interesting podcasts, be able to follow and link in on social media. And that's where the Global Health Gateway was established. And, and you've been involved in some publications as well, haven't you, with the Global Health Gateway? Yeah, we've done we've done lots of interviews. They're they're usually really informal interviews with um, various healthcare workers who've um, you know gone off and done some really interesting things in global health, either at a, a local level, a national level, or an international level. So we just try to keep people inspired and engaged, um, and make it easy for them to stay engaged. Mm. So, so that's the Global Health Gateway, um, and that's the one that I've been involved in for well nearly five years now. And and sorry, one of the things that you've done also is a guide to working abroad. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. There was um there was eight of us that decided to publish um a guide for junior doctors and medical students who are interested in working in overseas uh, under-resourced communities mm. um, in, a, in a medical setting. And um, it ended up being, uh, started off as quite a, a, a short thing and it blew out to a, a large, larger publication, mm. uh, looking at sort of uh, backgrounds of global health, uh, pre-departure training, things to consider whilst on placement, um, post-departure briefing and campaigning and advocacy um, right. on return. And, and, and I have to say that um, in the context of 2014 where global health has sort of exploded and, and it's become you know, such a, an enormous area of interest for young clinicians and medical students, um, this was really, this all happened, you guys were way ahead of sort of the, the, um, the trend. You, you were sort of five years ago when global health was really just starting to take off. And that was the, the context in which you established 
what was very innovative and still is um, a, an online portal for global health and engaging people in global health. I don't know if we were ahead of the ball game, but um, I, I mean, we've, modest, we've, we've definitely always. noticed the swell in, um, yeah. in interest in global health. Yeah. Um, if you speak to some of um, my colleagues who are slightly older than me, they would say, wasn't it great when we f had our first global health group, student group that got established in um, our university and wasn't that so innovative? And now we look around all the universities and there's global health groups. If it, you know, there's usually more than one at yeah, each university. Very, yeah. So, um, you know, maybe we were ahead of the ball game, but I think there's been our predecessors <laughs> yeah. have paved the way. So, modesty is always your middle name. And <laughs> and in Sadly. addition, in addition to that, you've been working on a forum here in Melbourne, which is also. Mm -hmm. Dare, dare I say again, innovative in its approach to uh, engaging young people in global health. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, the um, the Global Ideas Forum has only been, it's only in its third year now. Um, and what we noticed was that a lot of health professionals from all different kinds of backgrounds were wanting a global health conference here, um, a, a point of contact where they could meet other like-minded individuals. So um, it probably grew out of again, a, a, a predecessor, um, the AMSA Global Health Conference, which was... That's um, the Australian Medical Yeah, Student the Australian Medical Students Association, and they, um, back in 2006, six, yeah, they, um, or 2005, they started um, a Global Health uh, Conference for medical students, and that um, became incredibly popular mm. um, and sells out every year. So we were noticing that um, a lot of, of, again, young healthcare workers wanted wanted a similar conference um, mm. uh, on the annual on the calendar every year. So um, it grew out of that. Um, the Global Ideas Forum really came from the fact that they were looking for uh, local projects that were, um, I guess, being innovative in some some degree and um, working on global health at a local level. So it mm. tries to profile a lot of um, organisations such as NCD Free, mm. um, amongst others, um, to, um, to, to, inspire, <laughs> to inspire yeah. those um, young healthcare workers and also to link them up to mm. organisations that are already in existence um, so that they mm. can re-engage and, and become part of, part of that uh, organisation should they wish. And there are a lot of really interesting parts. So, I mean, when we talk about the Global Ideas Forum and you describe it as a conference, I think it's um, sort of does it to a certain degree a disservice in that it's it's much more than a conference. And people think of it, you know, you think of a conference and you think of like paper presentations and poster presentations <laughs> and boring, yeah. falling asleep in the back row sort of mm. thing. Um, okay. But but actually the Global Ideas Forum is so much more. And, and, and one of the interesting elements is that you're actually given a passport can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so, I mean, they do... It, hopefully it's not boring. <laughs> not at all. I've heard, I mean, the, the rave reviews that I've heard. <laughs> There's lots of panel discussions around really pertinent current mm. topics within global health and they attract a variety of speakers to, to discuss and debate this. And you can get some really... Um, some good dynamic tension amongst um, mm. leading experts in global health, which always um, makes for a really interesting in discussion. Including yourself, because you, you, you had... They had the opportunity this year to sit around what was sort of a roundtable discussion with um, emerging leaders in the field, including yourself and a former interviewee, Fiona Lander. Um, so, so, can you, so you sort of get an, an intimate experience with, with people uh, in the global health space that they can sort of relate to and, and have some connection with. Um, mm, yeah. And how does this relate then to the, this passport? The I'm passport. dying to know. Yeah. <laughs> the passport is given to all delegates yeah. and... Um, there's various trade fairs at different um, different points um, uh, in the conference with lots of different organisations such as Global Health Gateway, NCD Free, uh, Medicine Sans Frontier, and um, uh, the delegates can go around. They can meet all the different people from the organisations. They can have a chat. They can get their passports stamped. Okay. Um, and so they get this passport with all these different organisations that they've actually talked to and engaged. And um, I guess an easy way of following up if they if they want to um, pursue this further. So. And, and each of them are given a country. Is that right? Each delegate who comes to the conference is given a country. Um, 
Quite possibly. <laughs> <laughs> this is what no happens worries. when you sit on the board yeah, and you're yeah. a little bit detached. You come up with the big ideas and then and then no worries. Yes, yes, they may be. Um, a friend of mine was America, so oh, okay. she was she I was know very they happy. They had family groups with different countries, and they had to meet in the various family groups to discuss right. de yeah, de yeah, different yeah. case studies. So um, I think I was part of the Mongolia group, and so the Mongolia oh, group to got to um, got together and um, we had a case study to work on over the two days. So. Cool. Well, talking of foreign countries, let's now jump forward because you um, not only have been doing all of this and, as I said, looking after small humans at a big tertiary <laughs> hospital nearby, but um, you also recently joined MSF in Afghanistan. So can you tell us a little bit about going to... And you've written for the blog before on this topic, but um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience and how long you were there for and what you were doing? Sure. So um, I think, as I mentioned at the start, I have always had a, a really strong interest in the humanitarian side of medicine, and it was one of the driving forces for me um, applying to medicine in the first place. So Medicine Sans Frontier was always an organisation that I had looked up to and felt really inspired by. And um, the time came after sitting some of my primary exams for emergency medicine that I was just feeling like I needed to have a break from a lot of the tertiary hospitals and re-engage with um, the reasons why I entered medicine. And I applied to um, MSF and, uh, and they accepted me. And um, the next thing I knew, I was being offered a, um, a posting in Afghanistan, in northern Afghanistan, in a place called Kunduz. Uh, for well, it was six months, but I ended up staying seven months. Mm. And this was when? This was two. This years was two thousand and eleven. Uh, sorry, two thousand and twelve. Two thousand twelve. Yep. Okay. So yep. I was posted up there to this trauma hospital that they had established. And and the interesting thing about Kunduz is that during the Taliban regime, it was it was a stronghold for the Taliban. So there's still. Um, post that regime, there's still a lot of fighting, violence. Um, so the hospital, um, which had it previously existed, had become quite run down, dilapidated. Um, it was um, not in use any, anymore. And so when MSF went back into the country, and, and note that they've had quite a tumultuous history in Afghanistan, but when they went back in, they, um, part of their proposal was to refurbish the hospital that was there. Um, and in the meantime, set up a temporary hospital around whilst the construction work was going on. And the, the prim primary purpose of the hospital was to act as a trauma hospital, um, really to be there for the conflict-related trauma. Mm. But what they found is that as a result of the infrastructure um, being quite poor, they've um, probably seen more road trauma, uh, road, uh, road uh, traffic accident trauma than um, conflict-related trauma. Mm. Now, they certainly still see um, a lot of blast injuries and stabbings and, and gunshot wounds and things like that, but um, they see a lot of um, motor vehicle accidents, um, motorbike accidents, um, pedestrian versus cars mm. um, and things like that. So, um, so we were dealing a lot with that. Um, I was initially sent there as the emergency doctor, but... Um, MSF were actually doing a small trial where they wanted to see if um, they could have a, um, an intensive care unit where mm. they had four ventilators and to see if an intensive care unit um, in this kind of trauma setting would make a difference. So I was incredibly dubious when I first went there. I thought an ICU in a low resource country which has barely any primary health care um, was, was probably the biggest waste of money um, I could think of. Uh, but when I got there, it's the ICU is practised in a very, very different way to intensive care as I've known it here in Melbourne. It, um, there was very judici judicious use of those ventilators. Um, there's a lot of young, uh, usually young men, who've got single system injuries, head injuries, chest injuries, that might need a short period of ventilation and being in an induced coma just to tide them over. And then you can extubate them and get them off that life support really easily and they walk away. There's a lot of fancy words in there. But basically, yep. you're saying that they become <laughs> sick, but they're going to get well again, and they're young, yeah. so you decide so. to put them on a machine that will breathe for them, them. to get them through the yes. period so yeah. they can become well again. Absolutely. Okay. And that's very different to um, some of our Western societies where we see a lot of elderly people who perhaps shouldn't necessarily be on a ventilator because sure. um, they may not come off it, and if they do... They're often, um, their often their recovery period is very, very protracted and um, is not always in, um, successful. 
Interesting. So it was a really interesting experience. Um, Afghanistan is a fascinating country. Um, it's a country that has been plagued by internal and external conflict for years mm. um, and continues to be so today. To, mm. today. Mm. And were you nervous going to Afghanistan <laughs> as a... I think you know the answer to this, Sandro. <laughs> I think your friends were quite nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Look, um, I think if I wasn't nervous, there would be something wrong with me. Um, sure. And I probably shouldn't have embarked on it if I didn't have some degree of apprehension. Mm. Um, but ultimately, the, the job sounded fascinating and that's mm. what drew me there. So, off Would I you went. go back? Look, I would. Um, and I, I have so much admiration for MSF as an organisation and I, I really look forward to the day when I can next go, go and work with them again mm. um, due to a lot of specialty training requirements that, that might not be for the next year. Mm. Um, uh, so if they sent me and they felt the need for me to go back to Afghanistan, of course I'd go back. Mm. But there's, um, there's a lot of conflicts um, around the world that also need human resources and in particular um, Syria and South Sudan mm. at this point in time. And is, is there a difference, do you think, in terms of um, you went to a conflict zone, um, did you actively choose to go there as opposed to, for example, a natural disaster? Is the medicine different? Sure. Um, and, and, and is that something you, you, choose, you yeah. chose to do or does MSF sort of send you Look, to one um, or the other? I think when, you, when you're doing your first mission with MSF, um, they tend not to put you uh, in what they term the emergency pool. Okay. The emergency pool is the pool of um, doctors and nurses um, and engineers that respond to things like natural disasters. Mm. And they are often, um, they, can, they leave at uh, a second's notice. So they often um, won't put um, people on their first or second mission in the emergency pool and they'll send them somewhere else Because um, you had beforehand. some, you had quite extensive training before you went uh, from MSF, didn't you? A week, you had a week or so, is that right? You had some time in Sydney and yeah. Brussels, or was Brussels after? Yeah. Brussels was after. Okay. Um, yeah, they do, uh, they do yeah, well. pre-departure training, yeah. so, um, which is really useful, particularly the security training. Okay. So, so they put you through that first. Um, You'd hope so, going to you would Afghanistan and so. Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And um, one last question about the experience. Do you think that your experience in Afghanistan has changed how you practice medicine back in Australia or at least your perspectives of global health back in Australia? Um, yes and no. Um, I think it's, it's made me wiser to the world of humanitarian medicine and it's, um, it's definitely honed my skills in terms of working in a, a low-resource setting. The way I practice medicine here at the Alfred or at the Children's is incredibly different. Mm -hmm. um, we operate in a very high resource setting um, with um, expectations that our healthcare system will deliver a gold standard of care. Mm. Um, and there's so many resources at our fingertips that, uh, which makes the complexity of our decisions enormous. Mm -hmm. When you don't have those resources available, that that spectrum of decisions gets narrowed immensely. And so in some ways, practicing in a low resource setting um, can just be choosing between option A or option B, rather than at the Alfred, I'll have options A through to T mm. <laughs> and, and having to decide which pathway to choose. So, okay. so they're, they're just different worlds um, mm. and and very hard to, to draw comparisons. But it does make you feel immensely um, privileged to be able to work in a setting um, like I do here mm. on an everyday basis. Fair enough. And, and one last question, Jenny, because um, I know that you need to go and probably have an early shift tomorrow morning back in ED. Um, any advice for people embarking on a career in global health or maybe in a clinical career and interested in global health or in a global health career and thinking about humanitarian <laughs> medicine, any advice that you would give um, to yourself, say, five or ten years ago? Oh, One or two pieces wow. of advice. Wow, what would I say to myself ten years ago? I, I would say to myself um, not to lose heart, um, mm -hmm. that practising uh, clinical medicine and pursuing a career in global health is always going to be difficult. It's mm -hmm. never going to be easy to tread both paths. Do I think it's worthwhile? Absolutely. Mm. So don't, um, don't, don't feel disheartened um, mm. and pursue it. And stay true to what you're passionate in. Thank you very much, Jenny, and um, all the best for the future. Thank you very much, Sandro.